An accused murderer faces a judge for the first time. Meanwhile, an exhaustive search through rural Yamhill County continues for the missing mother and son he's accused of killing. And a lack of funding threatens to shut down a needle exchange site in Gresham. Question is, what happens to the hundreds of thousands of needles that are dropped off there every year? She spent more than two weeks lost in the Hawaiian wilderness. It was a pivotal time in my life where I, I had to choose life. Today, the hiker rescued after 17 days is talking about her rescue. Plus, stuck between the grill of a truck and a hard place. How this peacock ended up in a sticky situation. Tonight on KGW News at 6. Our top story at 6. A missing mom and her three-year-old son are likely dead. That is the word from the Yamhill County DA. Carissa and William Fretwell were last seen May 13th, and today the man charged in the case appeared in court. We're talking about Michael Wolf. He is William's biological father. He's charged right now with murder, even though police are still searching for the bodies. KGW's Morgan Romero was in court today. And Morgan's cell phone records are playing a key role in this case. Cell phone records are playing a key role. Yeah, Laurel, cell phone records and surveillance video. It's all coming out of this probable cause affidavit that we got our hands on a couple hours before court today. It paints somewhat of a disturbing picture of why detectives believe Carissa and little William or Billy Fretwell are dead and why they believe Wolf, Billy's father, is the killer, despite the fact they haven't found bodies yet. This very serious charges. In court Tuesday, 52-year-old Michael Wolf appeared on video to hear his charges. These aggravated murder charges could carry with it uh, the death penalty. Prosecutors. It's a extremely complex case. And the judge saying it's an extremely complex case. A probable cause affidavit lays out a timeline based on cell phone records and surveillance video putting Wolf in generally the same place at the same time the day Carissa and Billy disappeared. Since we don't have the victim's bodies, is being built on um, an ever-growing mountain of circumstantial evidence. Detectives say before 9 p.m. on May 13th, cell tower records show Wolf's phone moving south away from work. It pinged a tower in downtown Salem, covering the area around Carissa's home. In the middle of the night, cell towers show it was moving back north. Not long after, Wolf's phone pinged near his work, and at 4.30 a.m., it was placed at a tower near his house. The affidavit says Carissa's phone sent a text message on May 14th from a cell tower near Wolf's house. It was placed in the area of his work later that day. Video surveillance from Wolf's work, Cascade Steel, showed him leaving during his shift and returning several hours later, carrying a white trash bag. Detectives say that does not line up with his story. There is a lot of other evidence and other information that investigators have put together which aid in the conclusion here that we believe that they've been killed. Tuesday, Yamhill County DA Brad Berry had to sit the victim's family down. They're the ones who've suffered the greatest loss here. And explain why they believe Carissa and Billy are gone. It's certainly tragic, the loss of a young woman and her small child. Uh, that's horribly tragic, um, but looking at the faces of the family wanting answers to questions that we don't have the answers yet, that's the really hard part. Detectives say Wolf is the only person who would benefit from Carissa and William's disappearance or homicide. Records show the two were in court in April fighting over child support. Meanwhile, the search for Carissa and Billy is still on. And I'm aware of other areas that were brought to the attention of the investigators yesterday or this morning even, uh, where they will be doing some additional searching. Barry says search areas are narrowing and expanding at the same time in rural Yamhill County and elsewhere. From here, prosecutors have to interview witnesses. Witnesses will have to testify. And then a grand jury will decide whether they'll issue an indictment. Wolf is scheduled to be arraigned on that indictment June 7th. Back to you. Morgan, thank you so much. So the teen accused of bringing a loaded shotgun to Park Rose High School earlier this month has been indicted now. 19-year-old Angel uh, Granados Diaz, excuse me, pleaded not guilty to the charges last week. According to court documents, he brought the shotgun to school. He intended to fire it inside the school, but no shots were ever fired. No one was ever hurt. The court documents don't reveal a possible motive here. The school's football and track coach, Keenan Lowe, as you may, you may know or recall, tackled that suspect, held him down until police could take him into custody. Lowe is an Oregon 
football duck alum, uh, as well as the coach there. Bail for Granados Diaz is set at $500,000. A driver who led police on a chase through two counties is in the hospital after crashing in Beaverton. Sky got this video of how it all ended. The van crashed, you see there, into trees. The Washington County Sheriff's Office says the driver was wanted for assaulting a police officer in Columbia City. The chase started in Columbia County and ended in Beaverton at Southwest Kattegat Drive and Southwest 170th Avenue. Deputies say the driver's injuries are minor. Well, you might remember this video showing a convertible driving down the wrong side of the road after hitting a bicyclist. Today, we have new information about the man allegedly behind the wheel. William Afinga was briefly in court today facing charges for felony hit and run. New details in court document include a motorcyclist who says he was nearly run off the road on the same day by the same Mercedes involved in the hit and run. Afinga's ex fiance also told investigators after she saw the news footage, she thought it was likely him, and that was when she asked him about it. He denied hitting anything, but acknowledged that giving a bicyclist the middle finger, quote, sounds like something I would do, he said. We've got to ask if your client is able to say anything, Mr. Rothinga, about the case or his cycle. say at my direction, but thank you for asking. Tips from the public help track him down. Afinga has not <laughs> entered a plea yet. He expects to do that when he's back in court later next month. A mobile needle exchange site in Gresham is on the chopping block right now as the Multnomah County Health Department looks to cut its budget by 3%. KGW's Lindsay Nadrich spoke to a county commissioner working to save the program's funding. Lindsay? Those in favor of the needle exchange site say funding it now could save money in the long run. Some neighbors, though, say how the program is run should also be part of the conversation. The Multnomah County Health Department is facing a $200,000 shortfall which means cuts have to be made. And for now, those cuts are coming from the harm reduction program. That's why the mobile needle exchange in Gresham is on the chopping block. That location is currently used by more than 300 people. And so far this year, 250,000 syringes have been exchanged at that site alone. In total, the harm reduction program collects about 7 million syringes every year. Those are 7 million uses of drugs that um, we are reducing the harm that can occur from those uses um, to real people, and that's a huge thing. County Commissioner Sharon Myron proposed an amendment to save the needle exchange. She says investing 200000 now could end up saving the county millions down the road by preventing the spread of infections and diseases associated with drug use that are costly to treat. She says treatment for hepatitis C runs twenty to $50,000, for example. They could contract a number of diseases. I'm an ER doctor and uh, one of the other things that I do and um, and I see those devastating consequences of what happens when um, people get infections with uh, with dirty needles. If the Gresham site closes, some people who live in the Montevilla neighborhood worry it will drive more people to the needle exchange there. One woman I spoke with says many neighbors aren't against the program, but do oppose the way the needle exchanges are being run and where they're located. They say they're seeing drug use on their streets and are experiencing problems with crime. I do totally understand that perspective. And the fact is that there have been studies that have been done and those have shown that actually in areas where there are these harm reduction clinics, I mean, crime actually decreases. We, as I said earlier, we reduce the number of needles that you're going to be seeing on the streets and in the parks. The final budget will be released on Thursday, so for now we'll have to wait and see if the program funding will be restored. Back to you. All right, we'll see what happens, Lindsay. Thank you. A federal judge has denied a request from the Barefoot Bandit to be taken off probation early. The man whose real name is Colton Harris Moore was sentenced in 2012 to seven years in prison for his cross country crime spree that began in 2008. Harris Moore is suspected of committing at least 100 thefts, many times barefoot in Washington, Idaho, and Canada. Along the way, he stole planes, he stole boats and cars, taught himself to fly even. Harris Moore, now 28 years old, wanted his federal probation to end five months early so he can become a motivational speaker. He argued it would allow him to pay off the $1.3 million he owes in restitution. The Longview School District says gift cards given by Delta Airlines to students on a school trip 
belong to the school. And that has parents a little upset. They don't like this decision. KGW's Devin Haskins explains what happened. Six students from the Longview School District traveled to Florida in late April. They were there for the National DECA competition. The school paid for a portion of the trip and the students raised a thousand each by selling these flower baskets. Jay Hooper's daughter was one of the students that went. She's really been into the DECA program. Um, she wants to rebuild the DECA program at the school she's attending now and uh, was all fired up when she got back from the trip to do so. But on the way home, Delta overbooked their flight and the students voluntarily agreed to take another one. Delta gave each student these thousand dollar gift cards. That's where things get messy. The last three weeks have been hectic. Um, even while at work, at home and leisure time, you're constantly thinking about it. I find myself shaking my head and smiling at the same time because I'm baffled by the situation. It doesn't make sense to me. He's talking about the Longview District's decision to require each student to return the gift cards given to them. They sent this letter home explaining their decision. The state auditor's office agrees. It says because the flights were paid with public money, the gift cards are in turn a public gift. This in no way benefits the school. They weren't involved in the student's trip and the inconvenience. They were being paid for their time and inconvenience of not catching the flight they were supposed to. The Longview School District Superintendent declined an on-camera interview but did say that he continues to work with the state auditor's office to make sure that they're making the right decision and will also address this with the parents further in the week. As far as the parents go, they plan on addressing the superintendent tonight at the school board meeting. In Longview, Devin Haskins, KGW News.